So you've probably heard of Vampire Survivors, and if you haven't, it's a short play arena horde survival busted build simulator reverse bullet hell roguelite, and if you think that's way too many words to describe this game, then I fully agree. I personally prefer the name Bullet Heaven, and decided to make this video to try and signal boost the label instead of the absolutely nonsensical disorganized mash of other potential genre names that I've heard this year. It's actually a pretty clever reversal of bullet hell, a genre of game where you have to weave through massive quantities of enemy projectiles while returning fire when and where it's safe to do so, usually against one singular foe or a small handful of foes on screen at a time. But in a bullet heaven, you're the one firing off massive quantities of projectiles at an equally ridiculous number of foes, mowing them down by the dozen every second. In essence, you're now the bullet hell. So sure, one could use horde survival, reverse bullet hell, or busted build simulator as accurate labels, but all three can easily be applied to a variety of other more established genres, and simply don't capture the essence of the genre in the same way that bullet heaven does. Now I could just rest my case with that, but the algorithm would yeet me and this channel into the shadow realm, so let's dig a bit deeper into why all this matters. Hey everyone, Wonderbot here, and welcome to my semi-comprehensive look at 2022's hottest new game genre that caught us all by surprise. Now I know what some of you are probably thinking. Wonder, why does a name matter so much? Try describing a game, any game, without using its name or anything truly specific to it, like Super Metroid without saying Samus, or Metroid. Actually, a bad example. Metroidvania has Metroid in it, but bonus points if you can successfully do so to a random stranger in less than two sentences without colluding. Let's go with Hades. It's a stylish, story-based, isometric action roguelike set in Greek myth. Now take out roguelike, and all of a sudden you have a completely different game. Like I've said in the past, and will say again many times in the future, Convenient descriptive language and categories makes it a lot easier for people to communicate what a game is to each other, and to find more like it. At the moment, if I want to find anything similar to Vampire Survivors, I pretty much have to go mining through Steam's roguelike or bullet hell categories, past countless games that aren't similar to Vampire Survivors in the slightest. And that's really annoying! By having a proper category for these types of games, it'll be so much easier for players to find games like it, and for developers to have their games found in turn, which is convenient for everyone involved. And when I say a proper category, I'd really rather we don't go with the tried and terrible tradition of slapping dash like to the end of an existing game's name and just calling it a genre. This is my line in the sand. We should not call these games Vampire Survivors Likes or Survivors Likes unless we absolutely have to. And we don't. Souls Like, Rogue Like, and even Metroidvania are all functional, but are really only tolerable because we simply never came up with better terms for them. There's a reason why we call Doom clones first person shooters instead, and in the past 10 years have invented clicker games auto-battlers, MOBAs, and so on, rather than just yoinking the names from their originators. Ironically, battle royales are the sole best exception, since they are based on the 1999 Japanese novel by the same name, but it fits so well that I can't imagine it being any different. So yeah, we could totally go back to the old days of naming every genre after their origin name, but only if we stopped calling video games, video games, and start calling them by their true name. Pong likes. Is Elden Ring a Pong like, I ask you? Hmm? Hmm? The answer is yes, by the way. And since Secret of the Magic Crystals is also a Pong like, that means both games are practically the same. They both have horses, after all. Wait, is that. is that a horse? Eh. I should also note that there are actually two pretty fantastic games named Bullet Heaven by Matt Rozak of Epic Battle Fantasy fame that are very solidly bullet hells. But in spite of them using the name first, I think it's better to acknowledge their existence rather than let that stand in the way of the genre using the same name. To further digress, I'd actually love to see him tackle this genre as well, as the dude is pretty prolific and makes some rather great games. 
On that note, let's take some time to discuss the core features of a bullet heaven. One caveat, not all of these are required for a game to be a bullet heaven, but they're common staples, and the more a game includes, the more it counts as a bullet heaven. Endless Hordes. Bullet Heavens thrive off of having droves of weak fodder that players can destroy by the dozen with each attack. And I do mean droves. It just doesn't feel right if they aren't packed in pixel to pixel during the last minute of a run. I'd actually say this is one of the two essential elements of a Bullet Heaven, as it's almost quintessential to the genre to be desperately carving out a tiny space amidst an ocean of foes at some point during one of these games. There's nothing quite like this in any other genre, and despite the potential stress of being in this situation, the sheer catharsis of surviving it is so incredibly worthwhile. Relatively simple foes, with no complex attack patterns at all, few animations, predictable movement, and generally low HP, there can be boss monsters or the occasional special tough foe, but they're rare and usually exceptionally rewarding to kill. Basic controls. Most bullet heavens have incredibly simple control schemes, usually limiting players to omnidirectional movement on a flat plane, with a few of them giving players the ability to dodge. Automatic attacks. Compounding off of the simple controls, most bullet heavens have players' attacks fire off automatically, usually in a specified direction, towards the nearest target, randomly somewhere on screen, and so on. This is becoming less common since auto attacks severely limit player interactions and thus design options, but it's still a common staple. Ample power-ups. Bullet Heavens have a signature form of power scaling that has players go from weak to overpowered in a very short period of time, while having a decent variety of options to keep the game from getting stale. These can be anywhere from increasing the number of projectiles that a player fires, adding status effects, causing killed enemies to explode, adding pierce or ricochet effects, or more. There are also quite a few bullet heavens with power-up evolutions or synergistic combinations that change how a power-up might work, which goes even further at making every run feel distinct and interesting. The sky truly is the limit here, and is almost entirely where each individual bullet heaven gets their chance to stand out from the rest. This is the other essential element to Bullet Heavens. Power-ups and how they grow, change, or synergize with each other is how Bullet Heavens get their fun factor, intrigue, and replayability. While having subpar upgrades isn't outright exclusionary, it's probably impossible to make a great Bullet Heaven without them. Probably. Hard but cheesable difficulty. Bullet Heavens are initially fairly brutal, but as players learn how to break the game, runs get considerably easier to win. Rather than being an outright reflex test, Bullet Heavens almost always test knowledge and understanding instead, which makes them extremely accessible to all kinds of players, rather than the most dedicated. Meta Progression While not strictly required, most Bullet Heavens feature scaling-based statistics that can be improved between runs by spending earnable currencies. These usually include, but are not limited to, damage, speed, HP regeneration, EXP gain, or even the ability to banish or re-roll offered abilities. Most meta progression systems tend to be fairly limited in scope, but a few bullet heavens have gone all in with massive talent trees that offer what feels like a nearly endless amount of progression potential, if players want to go that distance. As an aside, I realize this should go in another video, and it will, but if this has any influence on future bullet heavens, then I'd like to include it here as well. While meta progression can be compelling, it's far better to offer players options and control rather than outright power, because the former almost always leads to a better game, while the latter leads to wonky balance or just plain old grind. Simple level design. Almost every bullet heaven is set in an empty field with few if any obstacles. Some are infinite, some are limited by borders on every side, and a few might have hard vertical or horizontal limitations, like the library level from Vampire Survivors. I will admit, I'm really hoping someone makes a bullet heaven set on tiny planetoids at some point, because that would make going back for all of the EXP that I left behind so much easier, and because it would be a pretty neat aesthetic too. A hard time limit. While not required, every bullet heaven to date has had a 10 to 30 minute maximum runtime with a hard limit at the end. Players will get killed off by a near unkillable Grim Reaper and Vampire Survivors, but for most other bullet heavens, the remaining enemies will just simultaneously die before giving the players a windscreen. Short. 
Building off the time limit, bullet heavens have all been universally pretty short, which makes it a lot easier to go from one run to the next without pause. This cuts down on fatigue and makes it easy to fit in far more runs than a regular roguelike, let alone in the time that it takes to finish a full-length game. Fairly easy to make. Due to their relative simplicity, bullet heavens take far fewer resources and equally less time to develop and update, which means that every individual game, as well as the genre as a whole, have the potential to expand and evolve at a comparably rapid pace. I've been consistently blown away by the variety that the roguelike genre has had over the last few years, and I feel like Bullet Heavens have the most potential to iterate and innovate out of all of the other roguelike subgenres, as long as the developers are willing to break the mold. Low budget, low price. Paired with the simplicity, most Bullet Heavens are also fairly inexpensive, usually ranging from 2 to 5 US dollars. That isn't to say that the genre has to be locked to this price, but any game that wants to break the price cap will really have to do something truly special to succeed. Hopefully this list of common features grows over time instead of turning into a de facto rubric for what is or is not a bullet heaven. Currently it's pretty obvious what's part of the genre, but as long as a game feels like a power fantasy where you have scaling power-ups and are mowing through hordes of foes, it probably could count as a bullet heaven. I'm not joking. Dynasty Warriors and Left 4 Dead just need some wild power scaling over the course of a run, and you'd be pretty dang close to the same vibe. So where did this genre come from anyway? For starters, the first modern bullet heaven isn't even Vampire Survivors, but a mobile game called Magic Survival, which Vampire Survivors is heavily based on. Unfortunately, because it's mobile only, Magic Survival didn't catch on nearly as well as its successors at first, though it has gained a fair amount of popularity as the genre exploded. Going further back, there are a handful of other games that embody the Bullet Heaven concept, though they weren't intended as such. To be pedantic, let's start with the oldest examples, such as Robotron 2084, a brutally difficult arcade game from 1982, where players spawn in an empty field and have to dodge and blast their way through hordes of wandering robots. Or 1979's Asteroids, since it features a limited arena where players have to dodge errantly flying asteroids while destroying as many of them as possible for points. I realize that neither of these really count as bullet heavens, but it's neat to see how some of the core ideas behind them have lasted through into the modern era. Speaking of, the first modernish bullet heaven that I know of is Ten Tons' Crimson Land from 2003, which still holds up fairly well, especially with a modernized Steam release from 2014. It features the overwhelming horde survival common to all bullet heavens, though its upgrade system falls a bit short compared to more modern titles. More notably for me at least is Nova Drift, which straddles the line between bullet heaven and hell, cheesy as that line may be. It features an incredibly deep upgrade system as well as hordes of enemies that can really flood the screen at times, but a fair few of them actually shoot back or have a decent amount of complexity. One could argue that it doesn't count as a bullet heaven, and I'll admit I'm on the fence with this one, but it's close enough that it's worth a mention for anyone interested in seeing what a more fully featured bullet heaven could be like. That said, the genre's current boom is a direct result of Vampire Survivors, which launched on December 17th, 2021, and really caught on pretty much as soon as the Steam Winter Sale ended and a bunch of content creators began covering it relentlessly. To date, it has accrued over 110,000 reviews on Steam, which is a frankly ridiculous number for a solo developer's first game, and will likely continue to grow at a fairly baffling rate for as long as it continues to get updates. I think one of the main reasons why Vampire Survivors did so well was because it launched during a lengthy lull between major release periods. Very few games tend to release between the middle of December and mid to late January due to the holidays, but a rapidly rising $3 indie game is an easy exception to make no matter how much anyone spent on the Steam sale. This meant it had a roughly 2-3 to three week period of total PR dominance with almost no competition, and that definitely helped out a lot. But there's a lot more to it than that. Vampire Survivors really hit upon a secret niche that had only been tapped by a few other games over the last 10 years, and I want to delve into that for a bit. So why are Bullet Heavens so compelling? In short, Bullet Heavens have inadvertently captured the essence of mid-2000s Flash games, which have been on the decline for a while now, especially since Flash itself went kaput. I'll talk more about them in another video, but for those of you unfamiliar with them, Flash games are, or were, I guess, 
almost always low-budget passion project games with an extremely wide range in terms of quality. They were quick to load, faster to play, playable online in almost every browser, and fully functional on almost every computer. And due to the nature of the sites that they were hosted on, were almost always completely free. Most were silly little time wasters that you'd rarely want to play more than once, but quite a few were so engaging that you could easily lose an afternoon on them without even noticing. I lost my middle school years to them, and I regret nothing. But with the rise of indie games and far more accessible online markets, Flash games have been in the decline for the better part of the last decade. Unfortunately, this has also led to a serious reduction in small, bite-sized experience games, as most gamers expect longer, more fulfilling, more substantial experiences from the games that they pay for. This was further compounded by a collective perception that games with a base price less than $5 simply were just too cheap to be good leading most developers to aim for $10 to $15 price tags or higher, with depth and breadth to match. The issue with games like these is that they all require commitment to progress, to master, and to finish. And while that in and of itself isn't an issue, it becomes increasingly harder and harder to finish multiple of these games per month, or even per year, especially if you're playing the big blockbusters. Back in the early 2010s, it felt somewhat possible to keep up with a decent chunk of new and noteworthy releases. Now it's a total fool's venture. Or a profession. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that most of you watching this video probably have fairly beefy backlogs filled with countless high quality and even higher rated games, and that it can feel like an absolute struggle to load up, let alone finish any of them to completion. Instead, it's easier to pull up something familiar and comfortable that feels convenient and fun, rather than just another chore in your busy schedule. And Bullet Heavens pretty much embody that exact, specific feeling. It's really easy to squeeze in a run or two during a break, rather than loading up a whole game, waiting for the intros, waiting through a loading screen or two, traveling an indeterminate distance to the next bit of progress, playing for a little while and then stopping because you have to do something else. Sure, I could do all of that, or I could effectively beat a game a few times over in the same time span. Bullet Heavens are practically designed to jigsaw into whatever busy schedule you may have, and don't take up too much focus that you can't multitask with a YouTube video, a podcast, a call with friends, or if you're feeling gutsy, 20 idle games stacked up on a second monitor. Good luck. What I'm saying is that Bullet Heavens are perfect time wasters, because playing them doesn't feel like time wasted. They're a perfect little dopamine hit when you need a break, or a far more satisfying series of runs if you've got a larger chunk of time on your hands. Which is the other major reason why Bullet Heavens are so compelling. Their specific combination of mechanics is a near-perfect power fantasy formula that lets players feel immensely powerful, clever, and rarely, if ever, bored. One might think that Bullet Heavens are kind of dull at first glance, and sure, they can be, but it actually takes a tremendous amount of effort to find a build that could possibly make the game boring as a player, and likely involves a lot of trial and error to pull such a run off. Otherwise, you're generally always on your toes, staying a few steps ahead of your foes, running for safe gaps in the horde, grabbing what few EXP shards you can without too much, if any, damage all the while plotting your next few upgrade choices, hoping that RNG gives you the ones that you need, or perhaps something spicy and unexpected instead. Admittedly, this specific strength is fairly common across all roguelikes, but due to the dramatically condensed runtimes of Bullet Heavens, it feels far more distilled and without any real downtime. In fact, there are very few, if any, of the boring stretches that many other roguelikes might have, like backtracking, early run doldrums, or bosses that you could beat in your sleep. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Duke of Flies. Almost all of this is because there's never a single moment in a bullet heaven where you're completely out of combat, and the upgrades keep coming at a steady pace throughout a run, which keeps things from ever feeling slow or outright boring. And once again, because of the short playtime, it's very possible to fit in one to three runs, or more if you lose, of a bullet heaven in the same time that it would take you to finish a single run of most other roguelikes or like 50 plus runs in the same time it would take to finish a single AAA blockbuster, or 200 plus runs for some of the more critically acclaimed JRPGs. Which frankly sounds like a nightmare. Sure, some people would be fine with it, but there is no way I would remain sane if I had to play 200 plus runs of a bullet heaven as my only game without long breaks in between. 
But that's the best part about this genre. You can stop whenever you want, and there is truly zero lingering guilt for stopping midway, nor mental resistance for returning to a half-complete save a few weeks, months, or years later. I cannot tell you how many games I have left on hiatus that I can't bring myself to play again because I don't want to start over, nor continue where I left off because I'm either too rusty or simply just don't remember enough of the plot to comfortably do so. With Bullet Heavens, there's simply no such issue, and it's such a relief. If anything, it's actually really cool to come back to them again and again, especially since almost every single Bullet Heaven is in very active development at the moment. So a few month break might mean that I'll be returning to an almost entirely different experience when I decide to pick one up again. And that's not even accounting for mods. I am no expert on future gaming trends, but I'm more than willing to put my faith in the genre going strong for at least the next half year or so, doubling or even tripling in quantity on storefronts and getting enough recognition to warrant their own category or specialized sale. From there, they'll probably peter out in popularity as some new trend takes precedence. There likely will be a few new bullet heavens later on, either from developers hoping to revitalize the genre with their own unique spin or the ones just trying to ride the residual fame to some level of success. What I personally hope for is that more roguelikes take notice and either include their own bullet heaven or arena survival mode or to simply recognize the value in an incredibly tight core gameplay loop and play to that genre strength more rather than just adding more and more content until it loses all meaning. Look, I'm still recovering from just how ridiculous Isaac gets once you've unlocked everything. Supposedly it takes like 500 to 600 hours for someone to get the final achievement, Dead God. And depending on who you are, that statement will either sound like a really great time value proposition or actual hell. The influence of Bullet Heavens on other roguelikes has already started to spread here and there, most notably with the upcoming roguelike Lone Rune, which outright includes a Bullet Heaven alternative game mode as a playable demo. It's such a solid vertical slice for promotional events like the Steam Next Fest and grabbed my attention immediately. There's a very real possibility that I'll actually end up playing more of the survival mode than the full runs in the end, just for how streamlined it is. Frankly, I would absolutely love it if Bullet Heavens had a lasting effect on the wave or timed arena survival genre as a whole. I used to love those games as a kid, but the lack of meaningful upgrades and variety from one run to the next always left things feeling a tad stale. Maybe I'm alone in this, but I'd be over the moon if multiplayer shooters started to include co-op wave survival again, but with game-changing mid-run perks, unlocks, and twists inspired by bullet heavens to really spice things up and keep people coming back for more. I'm sure there will be some serious pushback on how a surprising range of games are starting to incorporate roguelike mechanics or outright modes, but I think it'll be a net positive in the end. The sheer potential of well-thought-out bonus roguelike modes in non-roguelikes is really exciting, and there have already been quite a few fun attempts, and a lot of okay ones, but I haven't seen any that try to apply ideas from Bullet Heavens yet, I think? And I can't wait to see how that turns out, if and when someone does. I'd also love to see low-budget indie games continue to rise in popularity. 2022 has been loaded with budget bangers, and there's a very real sense of creativity blooming within the constraints of small budgets and equally small price tags. Once again, it's the long-lost spirit of Flash games coming back, and I love it. Also, as a final note to Bullet Heaven developers, if you're listening, it's great that you're getting into the genre or thinking of doing so, but I highly recommend thinking outside of the box, as far as you can potentially. This genre should not be a restrictive one, and keeping too close to the core formula will inevitably result in a dozen variations of the exact same game with slightly different coats of paint. In the short term, the easiest way to make a unique bullet heaven would actually be to adapt other genres into being a bullet heaven, like hack and slash action RPGs, or first person shooters, or including a stronger story element similar to how Hades handles things, but you'll still need a strong core gameplay loop to make it worthwhile. Or having a bullet heaven with really nutty meta progression led build customization, similar to Path of Exile's absurd talent tree. Or even more simply, switching from top down to first person or side scrolling. 2D to 3D, making it turn-based, squad-based, heck, even adding co-op will go a long way and making a new bullet heaven stand out. Or I don't know, just go full cockpit perspective mech warrior and give me a big clunky mech to drive around, blasting hordes of small aliens or robots. Look, I'm just desperate for more new mech games, great or otherwise, and I, I'm not desperate, I promise.
All right, all right, back on track. There's a lot you can do with this genre because frankly, many of its core mechanics are just guidelines. What matters is mowing through hordes of enemies, making the players feel powerful, and having as few slow or dull moments as possible. Sky's the limit otherwise. In the time it took me to write this script, I've more than doubled, actually tripled my list of noteworthy bullet heavens which is a decent indication that the genre is still exploding in popularity, and will likely to continue to do so for the rest of 2022 and possibly part of 2023. It's kind of wild to see a genre expand so rapidly, and the sheer variety of them has blown me away more than once in a way that I just did not expect. I'll admit, I'm a bit worried that I'll get fatigued of them eventually, since burnout's been on my brain for the past three years in a very big way. But like I said, that's the beauty of this genre. I can always stop for as long as I want and come back for more when I'm ready. With luck, there will be a lot more waiting for me if and when that happens, because I swear I can look away for a week and miss at least two new games and a major update, or 12. It's wild. And if you checked out this video hoping for a list of recommendations of bullet heavens to try, I've listed every game featured in this video in the description below, and I'm already working on a separate video listing my top bullet heavens so far that I'm hoping I can finish in a week or two. I considered adding my recommendations to this video, but I think it's long enough as it is. Keep an eye out for it. For now though, if you like this video, please leave it a like and hit subscribe. And if you want to help support more like it, head on over to patreon.com slash wanderbot. These videos take a long time to make, and the more support I get, the faster and better I'll be able to make them. Plus, if you're a patron, you'll get access to perks on my Discord, as well as frequent questionnaires and polls asking for your feedback on what reviews and essays I should do next. And if you're already supporting me on Patreon, you rock. I could not have done this without your help. But for now, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Genre. 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 No, genre. Genre. Genre? Genre. Is it genre? God, I need to look this up. I've said the word genre so much in this video that it's lost all meaning. Genres don't exist, everything is Pong.